stand here before you at a total loss for words. I'm completely overwhelmed. Uh, since last evening when I came in here and you know I've been hearing various speakers I've, uh, from Sandeep Rao who you know in the guise of a stand-up comedian spoke. Um, I heard Major D.P. Singh, um, the Sampurna children. Um, I was listening to uh, Madam Poonam and each one of them have, have been telling a story which is far beyond anything that I have written in my life this far. For many years, um, I, I thought I was dealing with a disability. Um, I'm extremely myopic. So for me, basically, my vision, uh, uh, you know, length is just about six or seven feet in front of me. And um, I thought that that was a hard thing to deal with because it meant I couldn't do a lot of things. Uh, from childhood, I was told I can't do this and I can't do that. And I learned to deal with it and it, to a point now where I don't even think about it except when, you know, I have to climb steps or I'm at an airport and I don't know how to read the signs because it's too high up, etc. But generally, I deal with life and I think um, it's fine. But when I was here yesterday and then this morning and with the kind of stories that I, like all of you have been listening to, made me realize that what we stand here, I mean, when each person stands here and speak, it's not just about um, <coughs> excuse me, how they've been dealing with life, but it's also a great demonstration of the triumph of the spirit, the triumph of will. And um, this is what I wanted to talk about in, in my little uh, session this morning. Uh, when Feroz invited me to speak at the summit, at that point of time, I was reading um, Homer's Odyssey, and um, I came across these lines, which I wanted to share with you. Um, it's actually a little, uh, it, it has no relevance at all to the subject that is being discussed today. But I thought there was a fantastic phrase there that I wanted to uh, share with you. Uh, this is basically where, you know, uh, some of the men have gone and taken away the sun god's cattle and eaten them. And he is so enraged that he punishes them by hurling a lightning bolt and destroys the ship as they leave. And so there is a, light, a line that says, The Lord of Light requited their transgression. He took away the day of their return. Very often when my path crosses that of a disabled person, these are the lines that I think that comes into my mind of how in that final moment of resolution, there's a lightning bolt that is hurled from some divine force who shouldn't be doing it in the first place. And there is this uh, horrible lightning bolt that takes away their land uh, at the day of their return. Now, how do you understand what is the day of their return? I think the day of their return is basically of that horrible difference that uh, Madam Poonam was talking about of them and us. But, you know, the will to survive is so much that a differently abled person fashions his or her own day of return in a way that most of us who think that we are sound of body and mind can't do so. To many of us, um, we, we see disability as an abstract. We perhaps have a family member or a friend or a neighbor who battles with a particular form of disability. We know it from a bystander's point of view or even a carer, carer's. But thereafter, it is a world we have no real idea about. It is beyond our conception to realize what is it that they have to or you know every person has to deal with on a daily basis until such time we have to deal with um, uh, an ailment or an injury where we realize what it is not to have the full use of our body or mind. In my childhood I had a classmate Raji she had uh, polio and so she wore one of those iron braces. I had another neighbor called Narayan who was um, blind and there was another friend uh, called Banu who was hearing and speech impaired. Now as a child I perceived them as no different in any way 
except perhaps you know when my friend Raji wanted to climb a, a staircase I would offer her my arm just like I would perhaps have taken the arm of someone if I had to deal with uh, a staircase in darkness uh, with uh, Narayan I thought he was the epitome of cool because the way he dealt with his blindness was where he uh, purred like an engine when he was on the road and he would honk you know he'd use his foot to guide him from the street corners and when he took a left or a right depending on which side of the road he was in he would honk like a car and so everybody knew that he was coming and they would make way and I thought he was heroic because that was something that as a child I was never allowed to do and then there was Banu who couldn't join in, in a conversation but when she saw from the expressions on our faces that we were laughing and talking she would join in with her own string of sounds and we didn't see it as as an embarrassing uh, problem we didn't see it as something that was uh, irritating we just accepted her and accepted Narayan and accepted Raji each one of them in our own way as far as they were concerned uh, I mean the rest of my peers were concerned um, I wore these horrible soda bottle glasses uh, to correct my galloping myopia so for them this was just another uh, you know kind of minor disability that had to be dealt with but the problem was this was 70s early 70s in small town Tamil Nadu and there was really no kind of assistance that um, uh, Narayan or Banu could receive so they were shunted to the shadows of their homes and probably their lives stayed in those shadows that these children were different was something that I understood when I saw how the adult world dealt with them the parents went through a plethora of emotions from a sense of why us to a deep tenderness for a child who had lost that first battle in life to an irrational anger towards the world older siblings were sometimes um, not so comfortable and they wanted to keep them apart from their lives at all points they lived with the thought of being saddled with this disabled sibling once the parents were no more and I saw that there was a certain ruthlessness that was coming into their relations in today's world it wouldn't be so because there's greater opportunities greater possibilities for inclusion but the true horror of all this escaped me till I was much older and I realized the world is not the happy place that I thought it was the adult world is ruthless and while we may wear the veneer of civilization beneath we are all animals with fangs and claws and the survival of the fittest is what leads us on we will stand here and mouth platitudes about compassion and expansive world visions we will twist ourselves into tangles with cliches we'll offer a helping hand a caring eye an open heart all of this but the truth remains that somewhere deep within us most of us perceive a difference us and them <clears throat> in you know as a writer sometimes the subjects that I deal with may not be the subjects that uh, I'm entirely familiar with so in my novel lessons in forgetting I wrote about a young girl Smriti who changes from a vibrant young woman to a catatonic being shown of everything that made her human now even as I created the character and wrote the scenes of how her family her father and grand aunt worked at seeking to include her in every way they could I was working within the realm of imagination the truth was I had no real experience of what this entailed a month after the book was published I received a mail that knocked me sideways I was both overwhelmed humbled and emotionally wrought let me read to you segments from it so you understand why this is the mail <clears throat> I just finished reading your lessons in forgetting some 10 minutes back and on an impulse I'm writing this mail to you it is not a feedback it is something I really felt like telling you so here I am it's just that the story of Smriti had some weird similarities with the life of my sister which prompted me to write this 
My sister was doing her masters in Bangalore in 2001 when she became friends with these boys. One day they decided to go to Mangalore for a couple of days. No one in our family had an idea. They met with a road accident just two hours from Bangalore. She's paralyzed neck below now and it's been five years. The care, nurses, bed sores, we've seen it all in the last five years. Her accident happened eight, nine days after I got married. The new girl couldn't take the pressure, so we parted ways within a year. My brother never got married, neither did I after that, nor wished to. She has always been such a baby sister to her, and honestly, in real world, Meera's don't exist. It's just not possible that somebody can share that emotion and have that concern which the family has. It is fight every day. I was really moved when you wrote about Jack cleaning up his grown-up daughter. You know, my sister is a grown-up girl too, and except for my mom, there are only two of us men in the house. We are ne we've never let any nurse or maid powder her, change her clothes and other things. It's only in the morning she came once to bathe and help uh, with the toilet. Otherwise, between me, my brother and my mom, we care for her. I can only say whenever we are changing her clothes and all, we keep looking at the walls and keep talking about random stuff so that she doesn't feel embarrassed. Anyway, it's been five years now and we've learned to make fun of misery. But I never thought that the kid sister we were always so protective and concerned about would be so strong a person. She has hardly cried ever, only in the beginning maybe. But then she said, if this is what God has chosen, then let it be. I will make best of it. She can only talk, but she said, I'll make most of what I have. She enrolled for her MSc again and finished it this year. I wrote her exams while she was wording out the answers. Hope, that's the only thing that keeps this system going. Everything in life turns upside down when such things happen. Personal, professional, financial, everything changes. But we keep ourselves ready for the day the tide will turn so that we aren't caught unaware when good times return. I really have no idea why I'm writing this to you, but as I keep reading the book, however remotely it was, I could feel what your character was going through. It's not like I did not try to find out or I did not want to punish or get back whatever changed in my life. But in the end, you just give in, knowing there is no end in sight and it's a winding road. Where to stop is the question. Sometimes, or rather most of the times, we have to bow down and accept the fate. It is surprising and most saddening to see how people like my sister, Tanya is her name, have actually quit not for the lack of fight, but for no access to battlegrounds. I think Major Manik, he, he's a, a person in the Indian Army, uh, I think Major Manik spelled it out when he said it's not the fighting spirit that the differently abled lack in. It is not having access to the battleground. It's not having opportunities to bring to fore the fighting spirit. Last week, uh, you know, one of the things that I've also realized is most of the help available seem to be confined to uh, metros and big towns. Uh, but when it comes to small towns, you find a great lack of opportunities, you find a great lack of um, facilities and centers that help uh, you know, various children and adults get that uh, opportunity to get back into life. Now, last week, the Chief Minister of Kerala, he has a meeting the people kind of program that's organized uh, you know, in various districts. So there was a day-long camp organized at Trishur, which is a kind of smallish town. A friend of mine who's part of the program was telling me about how a group of 129 parents came to this meeting, the chief minister event, at 6 a.m. They came with their children because they didn't know where to leave these children behind. Um, parents of autistic children, parents from impoverished backgrounds who needed to make known to the chief minister how important and critical it was for the government to set up government-aided centers. My friend talks of how they waited there from 6 in the morning to midnight with these children, hoping to have their need heard. There are few government-aided centers available, and without it, these children 
don't stand a chance is a very basic example now Trishur has two uh, centers to train autistic children one is in the corporation limits so the first preference goes to children who live within the corporation limits another one is uh, in the outskirts uh, and there they kind of restrict it to children who come from you know within about four kilometers five kilometers radius so but there are these 129 children who have no place to go to and there are very few government centers available and without these these children don't stand the chance so battles can't be won just with the fighting spirit you also need to provide weapons and training so the application that these parents had sent out to the government was stuck somewhere in the hallways of some bureaucratic tangle. But this was a brave attempt by these parents to take the issue directly to the chief executive of the state. And as my friend narrated to me what transpired, I realized how much of a role not just the family, but all of us have in helping a, per a disabled person integrate with the society that we are all part of and how we put it off. It's not just about having ramps for wheelchairs and reservations for jobs and professional courses or separate queues, which is the least any civilized society ought to be making available. It's also about understanding and seeing how good they are and enabling uh, you know, these differently abled people to live their lives with great dignity and pride. It's about fashioning the day of their return. Now, as I stand before you, I ask myself, what is it that I can do? Perhaps as a writer, all I can do is draw attention to how we need to focus on ability rather than disability. The hero of the novel I have just finished working on is blind in one eye, and he wears a false gold eye. When he's asked if he can see with his gold eye, he says, I can see better because of that eye. Our differently able sisters and brothers teach us this, to take none of our abilities for granted. Instead of seeing them as lesser human beings, we need to appreciate that with what is available to them, they mostly make a better job of life and living. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, ma'am. I request the Dronacharya Awardee, Rampal Singh, to felicitate Anita Nayak. Kuch paane ki ho aas aas, koi arma ho jo khas khas aasha hai. Har koshish mein ho baar baar kar dariyaon ko aar baar. Anita, ma'am, I request you to sign the India Inclusion Summit painting. I would like to give a special thanks to Esther from Enable India. She is here for the benefit of people with hearing impairment. Can we have Esther on the stage? Esther, we would like you to sign the India Inclusion Summit painting.